Good afternoon and welcome to our Build Up California Network meeting. We are so excited that you are joining us today. Um, thank you for joining. We're going to get started shortly. If you could please introduce yourself in the chat and your role and affiliation. And also, we are going to be having a poll so that we can see who is in the room today. Um, so we'll get that up shortly um, and I'll make sure that I read it out for folks. We're going to also be having this meeting available in Spanish. If you would like to join the meeting in Spanish, um, we are going to open the Spanish language channel um, soon. I'm going to introduce our translator Rosario and remind everyone to please go slowly um, when they're presenting for the purpose of the pacing for our translator. So Rosario, if you can please announce the translation services, that would be great. Sure. Buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a tener hoy um, la, la reunión disponible en español. Si quieren hacer um, uso del de idioma, por favor, abran el canal. Lo vamos a abrir en un momento más. En la pantalla se encuentran las instrucciones para que lo puedan abrir. Y eh, va a estar disponible en español. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Rosario. Gracias. So if you would like to join the Spanish language channel, it is now available. Um, we are going to be doing a poll to see who is in the room. Um, gonna, I'm going to have Pam pull that up. Um, let me get that started. It's launched, so hopefully you all see that now. So our poll says, who's in the room? I'm going to be reading it for our translator. So the first one is, which of the following categories best describes your field of work? Direct early care and education, child care provider, early care and education, not a direct provider, academic and research, bank and financial institutions, business large employer, education, K-12, higher education. So if you could please fill that out and then also in the chat, introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. The other thing you can do while you wait if you would like to share in the chat um, something that you enjoyed, what's your favorite activity to do in the summer um, now as an adult? And what was your favorite activity to do in the summer as a child? If you want to go ahead and add that in the chat while folks are replying to who's in the room, um, Pamela just put it in the chat as well. So what was something you enjoyed doing as a child in the summer and what's something you enjoyed as an adult and i invite anyone to share um particularly excited to find out um what our presenters enjoyed as children um in the summertime And since we just got a couple more folks join the room, hopefully you also see the poll that's asking you to let us know who's in the room. I will end the poll in just a few more seconds and share the results so that we can all see who's joined us here today. So I am sharing the results with you all. Hopefully you can see on your screen that we've got a lot of direct early care and education providers here with us today and a lot of folks from the field of early care and education who are not direct providers. We've also got some friends from the nonprofit and community-based space, as well as banks and financial institutions, um, some government and some other slash none of the above um, participants here today. So I will stop sharing and send it back to Esmeralda. Thank you. And I noticed in the chat that some folks started entering and would love to invite um, Chief 
Children's Officer Sarah Duffy to share. I saw that you unmuted, so I'd love to invite you and also Supervisor Susan Ellenberg to share what your summer activities were. Thanks, Esmeralda. Uh, so I come from a family. I have, um, let's see, I have three sisters and a brother, and all of my sisters and I have summer birthdays. So it was a lot of fun just to have outdoor, uh, you know, grilling and ice cream and cake in the summer. And now my two kids have summer birthdays too. So one one's falls in June right around the end of the school year and the other is in August right around the start of the school year. So we always get to kind of bookmark our summers with fun birthday parties, kind of celebrating the end and beginning of new school years and then also just celebrating another year passing. So I always associate uh, summer with birthdays, which is fun. I love hearing that. I associate summers um, growing up with summer camp. I grew up on the East Coast and it was the thing to be shipped off for seven or eight weeks from a very young age. And with all of the, the dramas around um, living with peers for two months, the, the lifelong loves that I've taken from that were um, have been just a love of hiking and canoeing and being in national parks and having lots of outside adventures. If I could spend all of my time outside, I would, except for the sleeping part. I don't like to camp. <laughs> I like a nice bed at the end of a good active day. Thank you so much for sh both sharing. I loved hearing that. My, my daughter is currently at her first summer camp. It's only a week long and it's just a dance camp and I'm very excited for her first dance recital tomorrow. Um, and I love seeing um, what folks are sharing. Um, Benu walking in the park with her grandparents. I love that so much. Um, thank you to people who added to the chat. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I'm going to have, um, we're going to pull up our slides for today's presentation. Um, and we're going to start going through our um, agenda. Um, let me let a couple more people into the room. Um, let's see. Thank you. So here's our agenda for today's meeting. Um, first, we're doing our welcome right now, just some housekeeping. Please remain on mute um, until we have a question and answer section. If you would like to ans um, ask a question, that would be the time to unmute or during our closing. Um, also, for everyone who is speaking, please speak as slowly as you can for our translator to be able to share what you are saying in Spanish. Um, and if you joined a little late, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat and something you enjoyed as a child in the summer and that you enjoy now as an adult, um, that is still happening. Um, but with that being said, I'm just going to, um, we're going to, we already made the interpretation announcement, but maybe we make it one more time so that if folks joined late, they can join the Spanish room. So if you go down to the globe and hit the interpretation globe, there is a Spanish button for you to join the Spanish room. So with that being said, um, if we can go to the next slide and the one after that, please. Thank you. So for folks that are new to our space, um, we are Build Up California. Build Up California's mission is to ensure an equitable system of expansion, improvement, and preservation of early learning and care facilities. And this is a short blurb about how we work. We're building on local expertise and relying on research and best practices. We coordinate a statewide network to share information and learn from each other and advocate for facilities funding and state and local policies that support child care facilities statewide. With that being said, um, next slide please. I'm very, very excited because today we have a wonderful example of this. Um, and I'm super excited to introduce Supervisor Susan Ellenberg. She represents a diverse population of just under 400,000 residents in Santa Clara County, District 4, which includes the unincorporated community of Burbank, much of West San Jose, and the cities of Campbell and Santa Clara. Supervisor Ellenberg serves as the president of the Board of Supervisors, as well as the chair of the county's Public Safety and Justice Committee, 
and the vice chair of the Finance and Government and Operations Committee. She's a member of the California State Association of Counties Executive Committee and a board member of First Five Santa Clara County. Supervisor Ellenberg is a former trustee of the San Jose Unified School District. And I also would like to welcome Chief Children's Officer Sarah Duffy, who has led analytic and strategic teams serving the children of San Francisco and Palo Alto. She has been a policy analyst and consultant since 2008 with 10 years in San Francisco where she oversaw analytic efforts to inform investments with the city's Department of Children, Youth and Their Families. Ms. Duffy has a bachelor's degree in English from Stanford University and a master's in public policy from UC Berkeley. And we're very excited for them to share what they've done in Santa Clara. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. And I believe that our supervisor, Susan Ellenberg, will be sharing first and then Sarah will be adding, but I have some questions that we have to kind of guide our conversation today. So the first one, and they kind of all go together. The first one is, how did this project come about? So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me and Sarah to be here with, with all of you today. I am really proud of the work that we are able to do. And so much of it is to the credit of our only recently formed Office of Children and Families Policy and our Chief Children's Officer, Sarah Duffy. So Sarah, it is always a pleasure to present with you. So this project came about um, as, as quite a direct uh, outcome of the, the pandemic uh, at the same time that we immediately um, descended into the, the biggest public health crisis in any of our histories. We also were facing a significant economic crisis. And fortunately, we had a federal government at the time that was thinking about, or aspects fortunately, that was thinking about how we need to compensate or make whole some of those economic losses. And because I, I sit on the California State Association of Counties as a delegate and also the National Association of Counties, I had the opportunity to really weigh in in a meaningful way regarding how federal and state funding was going to be allocated to the, the various localities. And NACO, the National Association of Counties, advocated heavily for very flexible funding to go to counties, um, both for the corona, coronavirus relief fund, that was the first um, uh, CARES Act, and we used those funds, this isn't part of today's story, but we used those to do some stabilization for family child care homes. And then of course, more significantly, the uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds. And in Santa Clara County, we were allocated uh, $347 million and saw this as really a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to utilize funding to provide direct economic recovery to communities with respect to both school-based behavioral health and childcare. And we'll talk, uh, talk a lot more in detail about how we landed on, on those issues and, and what exactly we funded. But let me turn to Sarah first for any additional comments on that aspect. Thank you, Supervisor. So yes, um, I think you captured, you know, really the essence of the, the intent of the funds, which is with the American Rescue Act funding to really um, address some of the most critical needs that arose out of the pandemic. And um, I think statewide, certainly, uh, and uh, in the Bay Area, area regionally in Santa Clara County specifically, COVID just had a very hard hit on the supply of childcare and um, in turn families access to child care. And throughout the pandemic, there was a lot of very intensive focus on making sure that essential workers had child care. But then as we started to emerge out of the pandemic, we started to see, um, as, as uh, many of you are very closely aware, that a lot of um, families were not able to access affordable high quality child care because of the number of providers that had closed during the pandemic. So already, you know, there had been a declining supply and we're fortunate to have a lot of data in the county on what um, the supply and availability of, of licensed child care is. And it was really startling to see um, those numbers decrease um, at a really severe rate during the pandemic. So um, one of the really, um, key roles of our office and one that um, 
you know, I think I take to heart very personally as a parent um, and working with a lot of other parents and just talking with communities is, is the need for um, families to feel like they have access to childcare that meets their needs and, and that they feel um, they can afford and, and where their child is safe and really thriving. So that's the, that's the intent of the funds. And I'm really looking forward to talking more about it. And I also wanna echo the supervisors. Thank you for having us here today to talk about this opportunity. Thank you so much for that background. Um, we know that when projects like this come about, partnerships are important. So we would really love to know who are some of the key partners that you enlisted to really make this project successful. So, so many partners. So I'll, I'll call out the, the, the first really significant external partner for us, and that was First Five first five Santa Clara County, we actually went to them and asked them to bring us a proposal that would help us address the broad recovery needs, um, not only regarding childcare for families in our, in our county, but really looking at what, what um, ultimately came to be called the roadmap to recovery for children in Santa Clara County. And we created a plan that focused on three primary areas. We wanted to get funding and resources and support out to children who lost a primary caregiver during the pandemic. Uh, we wanted to focus on children's mental health and we went and, and our direction there was um, for wellness centers, mental health wellness centers on school campuses. And then with the childcare piece, the first thing that we looked at was how to fund the workforce, how to get money to providers that had closed down uh, so that they could reopen, how we could help train additional, um, additional child care providers. And this was the beginning of the Children's Roadmap to Recovery that was introduced in February of 2021. And I think, Sarah, that the Office of Children and Families Policy wasn't even really going at, at full force then. But um, what, once, once your team was, was staffed up, we, we started to build in lots of meetings with First Five to, provo to provide support. Um, and then we had these, we, we had a broader range of, of stakeholders that we needed to bring together essentially in this, in this puzzle piece. Um, so we talked with and connected to our community-based organization partners, uh, the labor movement, parent groups, so that we could design the very strongest program that would provide the greatest stabilizing impact on children and families in the county. Thank you, Supervisor. And I'll add to that. I think um, I, the when I started um, in May of last year, I, I actually feel very fortunate that the roadmap to recovery had been passed because it gave our Office of Children and Families Policy as a new um, a resource in the county that it outlined the key priorities. And I, I knew coming into the role what the, those priorities were and I agreed with them wholeheartedly having um, worked in service of children and families at the local government level throughout the COVID period. So, um, you know, I'll speak to the implementation piece that's happened so far with the with the uh, development of the infrastructure grant funding. There have been a lot of really critical. Should I back up? I'm sorry, I I probably should have articulated that. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I I didn't mention specifically what the grant was. So let me break that down and then go back to you for for implementation. Ultimately, we dedicated. $35 million to children's recovery. The first 5 million came from the, the CARES Act for those initial family uh, childcare providing, provided stabilization. And then it was $30 million and 10 million, uh, and Sarah will talk about all of the implementation, 10 million is going to uh, support the development of on-school site wellness centers, 15 million for uh, support of childcare uh, facilities, and then another five million on top of the first five million uh, to implement apprenticeship programs. These are paid programs for future caregivers who, by the way, get access to childcare during their training period. 
So that that's the high level. And, and apologies, Sarah, for not no, no, framing that up for you. Thank you for that context. So I'll talk a, about the 15 million in the American Rescue Plan Act and the implementation, but it, it, I definitely want to emphasize the investment in the workforce piece of it too, because when we go out and talk with childcare providers and partners in this area of work, we hear quite a bit about the need to build up the workforce and to bring in um, bring in new teachers and assistant teachers into the field that can help fill spots as we invest in the facilities. So um, when we started out, we knew we needed to have an expert administrator for the grants program. So we immediately um, reached out to the Valley Health Foundation in Santa Clara County because we knew that they had experience administering ARPA funds through a nonprofits grant program that had been launched earlier. And we thought that they we could leverage some of their existing grants infrastructure. So they were a great partner um, in thinking about kind of the, the intersection of child care and community health and well-being and helping us design the grants process. So they've been probably our one of our most significant partners, as well as First Five. From the very beginning, First Five, who holds all of the relationships with the existing family child care home and center-based providers, as well as with the Family Friends and Neighbors program, were able to connect us um, with licensed providers to give us input on what they thought would be most useful when we think about um, infrastructure grants. And we just, so then we worked on kind of taking this feedback that we heard from focus groups with licensed providers, also with conversations with local universities and colleges in the area that do a lot of um, robust uh, education and certification programs with local early child care providers and ask them um, also, what they think would be most effective in terms of funding infrastructure grants with really the goal of adding slots, adding child care slots, and with a, a sort of sub goal of addressing the need for um, infant and toddler care. So we, we quickly identified that as, as one of the highest need areas, particularly with the, the um, upcoming investments in transitional kindergarten and for four-year-olds, we wanted to focus in on those very young children um, and providing uh, opportunities to grow those programs. So we worked with licensed care providers to understand how, what types of grants would be most useful with colleges. We also talked with, um, there are 15 cities in Santa Clara County, and we talked with them about, from a small business standpoint, how they could help us with outreach, how they could help us with, um, with letting their building and planning departments know that we were going to be releasing funding for 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 infrastructure and construction grants that would require working in partnership with cities. Um, we worked with nonprofit organizations and foundations as well that support child care providers. Um, and you know there's some really strong organizations in the area like the Silicon Valley Community Foundation that have a rich history of working um, in community to to fund early care and education. So we just had a very um, a really productive and successful period of learning uh, about what the needs are right now currently in Santa Clara County to help us design the grants. Uh, and then finally, we also worked with our County Office of Education. They hold the resource and referral network in the county that has um, really the catalog of all of the um, licensed care providers. We've, we've been in a lot of communication with them around outreach as we think about you know, where all of the licensed care providers are, which neighborhoods have high numbers of closures. They've been a really a wealth of information too. So, so many partners, I'm not sure I've named them all, but, uh, you know, my goal has been really, let's take in as much information so that we can try to make this as successful as possible and hear all of the voices that, um, that can help contribute to a successful program. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, there's so many partners and I'm sure there's even more um, and all of the work that you guys are doing to connect it to really invest in ECE is super important. And I, I want to back up too. I apologize for not introducing myself. Um, I'm Esmeralda Martin Singh and I'm with Build Up California and the Low Income Investment Fund. I'm the Partnerships and Policy Manager. And our team is Shelly Mazur and Pamela Campos. And we also want to 
big thank you to Allison who's helping us from the low income investment with our translation today to make sure that it is um, uh, recorded in Spanish. Um, the next question that we have, which I think you kind of touched on a little bit already, but if there's something else that you want to add to this question is what were the different pieces of the of the project and what each piece of the puzzle was composed of and how it all came together. I, I know that workforce, you mentioned workforce being a, a big part of it, and that's really important because you need them. They both go hand in hand, right? So if you could just speak to this um, and how you involved other partners, you, you spoke about the County Office of Ed and First Five and the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, but just how else you like did this in order for the work to be successful? Well, just, just um, Esmeralda, to think about your, your hand in hand uh, comment, we, we really need three hands uh, because we need to be focusing all the time on facilities as the Low Income Investment Fund does so well on workforce development and on slots. And the challenge is how, how we elevate all three of these at the same time, because leading, leaving any one of them behind uh, really puts us in a position where children and families actually cannot uh, cannot take advantage of them. So I've been very pleased and proud of, of our effort in really trying to work all three of these at the same time. And that, of course, brings in the broad partnership that Sarah talked about and the wide range of, of constituents. And a couple of the kind of pieces that I just want to lift up here are that the mismatch right now is so significant and challenging. Um, one example is that in um, East San Jose and I believe in Gilroy, we have dozens, if not hundreds, actually it is hundreds of children who are holding state-funded vouchers. They are ready to pay their way to childcare, but there are no available slots near them. So it doesn't matter that they have the either the funding or the vouchers, they can't do that. We've seen also some data that shows that in theory, there are sufficient slots for threes and four-year-olds, but they're obviously not in the right locations because we have this, this mismatch between children who, who can't find slots and, and in other areas programs that, that go with, with empty seats. So that's a, a huge part of the challenge. Sarah mentioned uh, the new, the expansions of, of pre-K and transition, universal transitional kindergarten, which in, in some ways are exciting news, but is also going to wreak havoc um, for the needs of parents who are working full-time and need full-day programs. Neither of those programs are full-day, so we're going to have to be working with school districts in a new way that we really haven't um, had to intentionally focus on so much before because we're going to have to think about care that children need before and after school, which they may have gotten previously at a full day childcare. How do we do that? How do we make sure that we're also not decimating the childcare industry along the way? Because that is the only option for, for so many parents. So the, the very broad conversation and frankly, bringing businesses into this, this partnership is a really big piece as well, because we need businesses to, to understand, um, and they are more and more, certainly more post-pandemic, that they are directly impacted by the lack of a fully functioning, cohesive funded childcare system. So the more invested that community feels and understands that they are um, suffering with retention, they have underemployment, reduced productivity, cities have a harder time attracting and retaining young families, all of this comes back to the lack of a cohesive childcare system. So what we are trying to do in Santa Clara County is build towards scale. We don't have the resources to, to provide universal access, at least not today, um, but the work of Sarah and her office and all of these partners are bringing us ever closer to that. Thank you, Supervisor. I think um, to add to that, um, I'm glad that you brought up schools because I think that um, a lot of our schools in the county, and there's so many, have have are thinking about this TK transition. So we've been talking with them about what they think the impacts are um, and how to address this very um, real need for families to have 
quality appropriate care for the full day for four-year-olds um, as they work. And then also having lots of conversations with um, licensed providers, particularly with our um, nonprofit providers that many of which accept the subsidized child care about how, what they think the impacts of the transitional kindergarten may be um, and how they can use this funding to build up spaces available, um, particularly for the younger children. I also think that, um, you know, as you were describing all the various partners, uh, supervisor, that it really, early child care, particularly for the young, very young infants and toddlers, is there's such a, a, a sort of a quilt of different types of child care that, um, that families prefer and that meet their needs. And so there, it, it means that there are many, many different partners to consider when we think about what kind of, what kind of child care might make sense for a different family. So yes, um, some families use child care on site at their business. Some prefer it close to a school where, they're, where siblings may attend. Some people feel more comfortable um, with a home close to where they live in a small setting. So the, the wonderful thing about the, this grants program is that it will allow all of these various types of providers to apply for funding. Um, and our job over the next two months is really to provide outreach so that everyone um, knows that this funding is going to be available. So that, that's a major role of our office. And then looking into the future, thinking about how to come up with um, sustainable funding to continue to um, add spaces uh, for childcare in the county. So it, it really is a patchwork. It's a need for a lot of creative thinking and a need for getting as many as much input, input um, and outreach done as possible as we prepare for the grants. Great, thank you so much. Um, I am doing a quick little time check and I see that it is 2.33 and I do think that some of the funding resources um, that made this project successful um, were shared. And so what I would like to do now is invite everyone in the room if they have a question that they would like to pose. Um, there is a question and answer feature. I noticed that Lori um, from the Child Care Law Center has asked a question. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Pamela Campos, who's going to be helping to lead the next part of our agenda, which is a question and answer and reflection time. Thank you, Esmeralda. Um, so the question that Lori shared uh, is asking for the child care facilities funding in Santa Clara County, will this include funding for family child care providers? I can answer that. Um, yes, it absolutely will. Uh, it will include funding for all, lic all licensed child care providers that will be able to, um, to apply for funding. And we're actually doing some work with the city of San Jose and with um, the County Office of Education to uh, outreach to um, some really unique programs to bring family, friends, and neighbors providers into the licensed child care realm. Um, and and uh, transition from providing care just for you know one or two children into providing licensed child care. And we're really hoping that we'll have some of those um, new licensed child care providers apply for seed money to open up family child care homes in their residence. So yes, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. Um, we always wanna make sure that we are being equitable in providing funding to center-based and family child care homes because parents need access to a multitude of options. Um, they deserve that, right? So we really appreciate you considering that. And um, I don't see any other questions in the chat or in the Q&A. I did just want to highlight a slide that Build Up California presented in March for um, the Designing Women event with Catalyze SV, and it's related to the top five barriers that child care providers experience when it comes to being able to expand their facilities. So I'll just share it briefly so that everyone can see what I'm talking about. And my question um, to Supervisor Ellenberg and Sarah is, uh, if you had a magic wand as a policymaker, what would you want to see that could work towards eliminating one of these barriers? 
What would that dream legislation look like? And what steps uh, can we take to get us there? So, Pamela, I have to pick just one. <laughs> yeah, I want two ones. Well, I, I would I would first go for a, a steady ongoing funding stream at the at the state level that, of course, is flexible that allows us to um, support the income cap that, that's appropriate in, in our own communities that would allow us to fund full day programs that would pay childcare providers a, a living wage and benefits so that we can actually attract people to, to choose and stay in this, um, in this field. And truly, I think everything else uh, flows from that. In, and, and and I think that um, building a statewide coalition around some very specific asks um, is, a, is an important piece that we need to, um, to hone in on. I, um, th there's a sense, especially around TK and, and pre-K that, that the legislature is done and, and they're not done. So I think having very, very broad coalitions from community-based organizations, local governments, um, labor partners, business partners, all moving in the same direction uh, can give us some significant uh, forward momentum. And then truly all of those other things will be able to come. Yeah, you are talking my language. We need so many things to get us to reach our goals. So thank you for envisioning a future where we, we can work towards that together. Sarah, would you like to share an answer? I agree 100% with the, with the um, steady funding stream and coalition um, to help identify solutions to improving the supply and the access and the quality. And I think, um, you know, that can help with figuring out, find, you know, having a centralized or a strategic way to find spaces, and then also really identifying what are the um, roadblocks with some of the zoning, planning, um, building inspection pieces. Um, I think a lot of us have, have heard and may have firsthand experience with some of those challenges, but they feel like challenges that can be overcome if we have um, some really strategic collaborative thinkers um, looking at, at solutions in those spaces. So I think if there's funding and coordination, we can make, make we can do anything. big strides. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I I recognize that there's a lot of power in coalition building and bringing folks in to help us um, bring solutions to the table that work for our community at large. And there's definitely been a lot of interest with our um, colleagues here at Build Up California, with the folks that are in our network, especially the early care and education providers who are a big part of Build Up's success. So uh, we hope that in the future, we can dive more into that topic about how to build coalitions at the local and state level, and also how to engage with local elected officials and other key groups that will help us um, get funding for early care and education facilities. So I am going to pass it back to Esmeralda for the next section. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to go ahead and spotlight our next two presenters. And we want to give a huge thanks to Supervisor Ellen Berg and Chief Children's Officer Sarah Duffy for sharing this amazing work that they're doing. Yeah, I love the little clapping emojis and a heart from all of us. Like, thank you for sharing that with us. We're going to spotlight um, Eric Salcedo, who is a policy analyst at the California Budget and Policy Center. He conducts research and analysis with the goal of improving the education system so that all students have the resources and opportunities to thrive. Eric supports the Budget Center's work by focusing on equitable funding of K through 12 and higher education and the impacts that race and gender, gender neutral policies have on students and their families. And through this work, Eric also develops recommendations for state policy. So I'm gonna add a spotlight to him. And then I'm also gonna add a spotlight to Laura Pryor, who is a senior policy fellow at the California Budget and Policy Center who conducts research to strengthen California's early 
early care and education system. Foundational to this work, Laura produces analysis and to support expanding opportunities for families to access the early care and education programs that best meet their needs. Her work strives to center priorities most urgent for families and child care providers to contribute to an equitable early care and education system. So we want to welcome our next two presenters who are here to give us a state budget update, which we know is very timely as this week has shown. So I'm going to hand it over to Eric and Laura, who will be sharing their slides and giving us a update on the budget. Thank you for Thank being you. with us. Thank you so much, Esmeralda, and thank you so much to the Build Up community for having us today. We're really excited to be here to talk more about the budget. So my colleague Eric and I will be sharing information about the 23-24 California state budget, and in particular, sharing key implications of this budget for early learning and care. So thank you so much, Esmeralda, for the wonderful introductions for Eric and myself. So I think for the sake of time, I'll just go through and just give a broad overview of the Budget Center. For, so for those of you unfamiliar, the California Budget and Policy Center is a research and analysis organization that operates at the intersection of a think tank and an advocacy group. So we provide the research and public education needed to inform transformational policy change and enable advocates, organizers, policymakers, and staff in philanthropy to actively engage in public policy. So I think we can move to slide three. So for our presentation today, Eric and I first plan to share a few key contextual points regarding the 23-24 California state budget. And then from there, we will highlight major early learning investments included in the budget agreement, as well as other important provisions. And we'll conclude through highlighting key implications for Californians and also leave time at the end of our presentation for question and answer. So before diving into the specific budget items, we're going to start with an overall picture of the budget and specifically the 23-24 California state budget. So first we wanted to just take a step back and reflect on the purpose and importance of the state budget overall. So the state budget affects all Californians. Specifically, state budget decisions help determine things like whether kids have a safe place to play and learn while their parents are working, whether youth have access to an affordable college education, whether people with disabilities and older adults have access to the care and supports they need to remain in their own homes and communities. And at a fundamental level, budget choices answer the question. Next slide. What kind of California do we want to live in? So throughout this presentation, we'll share the 2023-24 state budget choices as they relate to early learning and care, which hopefully strives to reflect the type of early learning and care system we'd all want to see in California. So to create the state budget that best reflects the California that we all want to live in, a specific process is conducted each year. So this past year, this process looked like what you see on this slide. So specifically, the governor presented the first draft of the budget in January of this year. After this, budget subcommittees in the State Assembly and Senate review the governor's proposed budget and begin to craft their versions to better reflect the needs and values of their constituents. Four months later, the governor released the May revision, which contained several updates and changes from that January draft. And then from there, the Senate and Assembly moved toward finalizing their versions of the budget in subcommittee hearings. Then on June 15th, the Senate and Assembly passed their joint budget agreement, which did differ from the governor's May revision in several instances. And then after that, the legislator and governor negotiated a budget deal amending what was passed on June 15th. And the governor signed the new budget agreement on June 27th, which will go into effect at the start of the fiscal year, which is July 1st. So how does the state budget look, you might ask? Well, overall, total spending in the 2023-24 state budget amounts to approximately $310 billion. And in balancing the budget, the final plan includes several important points. So first, the budget protects what's called the safety net reserve. 
So in other words, the budget does not use any safety net reserve money. So the safety net reserve was created with the intention that it would be used to maintain CalWORKs and Medi-Cal benefits in the event of a recession when these programs typically see higher caseloads due to higher unemployment. So the governors may revise proposed tapping into the safety net reserve, which would have meant that these critical programs could have been vulnerable to cuts when the economy eventually does go into a recession. So it's really good to see that the final budget does not draw on any of these reserves. Also, the budget does not include any ongoing cuts to core programs and maintains planned program increases for schools, higher education, CalWORKs, and Medi-Cal expansion, and more. And lastly, the state budget includes a reserve of nearly $38 billion, which is a record high, which given the shortfall the budget is facing, as I'll explain more on the next slide, it's definitely notable. So speaking of the shortfall, the budget agreement does project a gap of approximately $30.7 billion. This shortfall is due largely to lower than expected current year tax collections, as well as economic conditions such as higher interest rates and a weaker stock market. However, the budget does not assume a recession, and it's also important to note that, that the Legislative Analyst Office estimates the shortfall is likely to be about $6 billion higher than what is in the administration's estimate. So as noted on an earlier slide, the budget is balanced and even contains nearly $38 billion in reserves, so how does the budget address the shortfall problem to make this happen? Well, namely, the budget proposes reductions or delays mainly for one-time or temporary funding commitments made in recent years when there were surpluses. And mainly this is in areas like infrastructure. So this allows the administration to protect those core public services from cuts, as I noted earlier. It's also important to note that many of these reductions and delays are subject to what's called trigger restoration language. So where if the state does have enough money in January of 2024 to support it, the funding could be restored halfway through the fiscal year. But given that there is a significant chance the shortfall will be larger per the LAO's predictions, these restorations are probably unlikely. Additionally, the budget proposes cost shifts, which includes things like borrowing from special fund balances and proposing to use bond funding instead of general funds for some projects. The budget also renews the Managed Care Organization Tax, or the MCO tax, which is the tax on managed care organizations, which allows the state to draw down additional Medicaid matching funds, which then offsets general fund costs. And it's also important to note that this renewal will be subject to federal approval. And lastly, we wanted to note that the governor did reject the Senate's plan to raise revenues via an increased corporate tax for businesses that make 1.5 million or more in profits annually. This would generate several billion dollars in investments each year, which would create perhaps the revenues to fund more programs. So several decision makers have expressed concerns about the implications of the 2023-24 budget for future budget years. And one way to address these challenges would be to raise revenues, particularly through raising taxes on extremely profitable, profitable businesses. So this proposal is included in Senate Bill 220, which is alive in the legislature. so we will see how that unfolds. So given these contextual points, I'll now pass to Eric to talk specifically about key budget areas impacting the early learning and care system. Thank you, Laura, and thank you again, Esmeralda, for the invitation and the great introductions at the beginning. I'm ha really happy to be here and sh share some information with you all. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, highlighting a few items included in the budget related to early learning and care. Um, of course, we won't be touching on everything, just a couple of high, a few highlights that we thought uh, were important to share with you all. Um, one of the major wins included in the 23-24 budget is that it permanently reforms family fees. This is significant because families with low income should not have to pay hundreds and thousands of dollars in fees a year. And then with this reform, many families will be able to save a larger portion of their income and pay for other needs such as housing, food, and utilities. And to provide you with some more specifics, uh, under the new fee structure, which begins on October 1st, 2023, families below 75% of the state median income, or SMI, will pay no fee for subsidized child care. 
And then families that, that are at or above 75% of the state median income will pay fees that are capped, that are going to be capped at 1% of their monthly income. Um, in addition to that, the budget allows family allows um, family fees that were accrued but aren't collected prior to October 1st, 2023 to be forgiven. And then the budget appropriates around 78 uh, million from the general fund and Proposition 98 general fund to the Department of Social Services and the California Department of Education or CDE to reimburse child care providers uh, for those family fees that are going to be waived or reduced. So major, major win in this area. Another major item included in the agreement is that it includes one-time rate increases for child care providers. The budget includes uh, up to a total of $2.8 in one-time funds for reimbursement rate increases. However, it's still unclear how those dollars are going to be distributed to providers and whether that increase may be ongoing uh, once those two years are done. Um, all of this is subject to negotiations between the governor and the child care, child care providers union. Um, and we know that the current contract expires tomorrow, so we'll, um, I'm sure we'll be getting more details soon um, about developments in that area. And then in addition to that, the budget requires CDSS uh, to develop an alternative methodology in collaboration with CDE. Um, and this alternative methodology is to re uh, inform the reimbursement rates for subsidized child care. And a little bit more on that, oh, sorry, not that one, is that this alternative method methodology is based on cost. Um, so it would reflect that in, it, in, the, in, the new, um, in that new alternative methodology uh, compared to what is what we currently have. In addition to that, there's also a, the budget also extends the hold harmless provisions for all child care and preschool programs to September 30th, 2023. And what that means is that uh, the reimbursement will continue to be based on enrollment rather than attendance. And then lastly, uh, the budget also maintains that January proposal to delay 20,000 new child care slots in 2023-24 to 24-25. And then moving on to transitional kindergarten. And when, when we joined, we heard there was a conversation around that. So um, curious to check in with others about you know, the conversation there. So the 2023-24 budget continues to fund UTK expansion as it moves into its second year of implementation and provides $597 million uh, for enrollment growth. Uh, and that equates to about 42,000 new enrollments in 23-24. In addition to that, it, the budget maintains current ratios for TK, the 1 to 12, and also it delays the requirement to lower the ratios to, to 1 to 10 until 25-26. Moreover, the budget extends the deadline for TK teachers to earn the 24 units in uh, early childhood education, a child development permit, or an early childhood education specialist credential um, and that's being extended from August 2023 to August 2025. And lastly, the budget does delay or continues that delay that was proposed in, in January of $550 million in facilities funding for TK, CSPP, and kindergarten. And that delay is being moved to 24-25. And then related to the state preschool program, um, the budget delays the requirement that at least 7.5% of enrollment in CSPP is reserved for uh, students with exceptional needs. This requirement was set to begin on July 1st, 2023, and the enacted budget changes the start date to July 1st, 2025. Then in addition to that, trailer building, which suspends the cost of living adjustments, uh, for the, um, the California State Preschool Program, um, and that's related to those uh, reimbursement rates in 23-24 and 24-25. So the new rating adjustments in 23-24 and 24-25 
um, are going to align with the agreement uh, between the administration and the child care providers union. And then lastly, the budget uh, streamlines uh, eligibility for the state preschool program for three and four year olds. Specifically, this means that um, this means that it, it is not required that the third priority for services be given to three and four year olds who are not enrolled in a state funded transitional kindergarten program. And then it re revises other priorities accordingly. So those, those are some of the major highlights related to early care and education. And wanted to end by um, recapping and providing some reminders of what's next in, in 2023. First, as, as Laura mentioned, the new first school year starts on July 1st. Um, so remember that lawmakers after this date may pass additional amendments to the budget bill and even pass additional budget related bills. Um, we're also waiting on negotiations, as I mentioned earlier, between the governor and CCPU, the Child Care Providers Union. Um, hopefully tomorrow we'll learn a few more details on what the developments are in that area. Then in September, um, the family fee waiver, uh, that it's going to end on September 30th, and then the new family fee reform will begin on October 1st. Um, and also that whole harmless that I mentioned, those provisions are going to end on September 30th. And then lastly, we wanted to uh, mention a little bit about the policy bills. Many of you have been following developments of many bills. For example, I've been following uh, AB 393, which would require DSS to identify dual language learners in child care programs. So the governor is going to act on many of those policy bills in September. Um, and then um, the deadline for the, um, for the legislature to pass bills is going to be September. So between September and late September, that's when the governor will take action. So at this time, I'll pass it back to Laura um, for any uh, Q&A. Uh, she's going to moderate that. So back to you, Laura. I'm actually perhaps passing back to Esmeralda to moderate Q&A, as I saw uh, how you did it with the previous speaker. OK, thank you so much. Um, and big, big thank you to Eric and Laura for their presentation. We really really appreciate your expertise in this area and for sharing it with our group. Um, I'm just going to do a quick little time check and I noticed that it is 2.58. Um, our meeting is from 2 to 3. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to Supervisor Ellenberg and, and Chief uh, Children's Officer Sarah Duffy again for sharing the amazing work in Santa Clara. To Eric Salcedo and Laura Pryor for their work on the budget this year is different. It requires ongoing advocacy. I know that there are providers in the state capitol right now that are still advocating to this very moment because we know that um, tomorrow is really the deadline and they're really waiting until the end for this, right? So um, thank you for all of the things that you guys have done for advocating so that this can continue to be um, spotlighted. And the spotlight really showcased the best practices in the state of California and helps us to continue our mission at Build Up California, which is really to expand access to affordable early care and education facilities in the state of California and really give families options. Um, we hope you feel inspired to build your coalition in your county and continue advocating for budget investments. And we are gonna be putting a link to a survey in the chat, um, please make sure to fill that out before you leave. We really want to hear from you. Um, we're also going to put our emails in the chat. Um, our Build Up California team will put our information there in the chat so that you can reach out to us post-meeting since we are basically at the end of our time. But I really want to thank everyone who shared this space with us um, today. I know that everyone's really busy. I know we have a holiday weekend approaching, but the work doesn't stop. Um, and so thank you for being here and for really sharing your time um, with us today. Um, the survey will go in the chat a few more times and I'm gonna also put my email and Pamela will put her email in the chat so that you can reach out to us if you have anything that you would like to ask us. And we're gonna put a song on as we do an outro. Thank you so much. I'm also going to put Eric's email. He also gave me his. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for sharing space with us today in community. Have a great rest of your day.
Thank you. 